Okay guys, we are talking about neck pain patterns today. So you know that recognizing clinical patterns is an important part of becoming an expert. So if you go into the head and neck region of the Clinical Pattern Recognition Orthopedic app, you can see that you could either play this out by using pain patterns. So you can play this out by using pain patterns. So when you use the pain patterns, you can use it as a way to generate hypotheses. So the patient reports sharp, deep pain right here in the upper quadrant near the uh, junction of the neck and the shoulder girdle. So I think about what kind of conditions might generate this type of pain pattern. I come up with a list in my mind, and then I match it to the list that comes up here. So this says, okay, neck pain with mobility deficits or neck stiffness spondylosis or facet syndrome, these are a number of different pathologies that could be associated with neck pain and mobility deficits. And then you have cervical sprain strain, whiplash, yes, that could be caused, these pathologies could cause this type of pain pattern. And you always recognize that I'm always thinking about whether the patient fits the common musculoskeletal patterns or are there red flag conditions that may mimic this pain pattern. So here are a number of common red flag conditions that you should be familiar with. All right, so if you look here at ligamentous instability, there's some basic history, basic findings, and how you would potentially screen these things out using the Canadian cervical spine rules um, or the nexus here. Okay, so let's move deeper into the pattern. So we're talking about neck pain and mobility deficits. So we'll skip to the all diagnosis and we'll go deeper in here. You'll see that there's always prevalence data. So this data is generated from a number of different articles. We just recent, this data is generated from a number of different articles. You can see that they're linked here to the PubMed abstracts. And it gives you a sense of how common these patients will present in the general public. The next thing that I want you to see is that there is a clinical findings video. So let's watch how this patient presents. Neck pain with mobility deficits or cervical spondylosis. The patient typically reports unilateral neck pain and possible referred pain into the upper extremity. The pain usually limits active and passive range of motion and is associated with findings of limited mobility on accessory motion testing. This is usually preceded by an awkward movement or awkward posture causing the symptoms. So you can note that we are beginning to paint a picture of how these patients will present to you in the clinic. He has limited range of motion. His pain is localized typically to his upper quadrant region. If we go into the physical exam, you will find key findings, movement faults, associated impairments, and differential diagnosis. So let's rule out other common conditions first. So you know that the pain pattern is up in the upper trap region. So in the differential di diagnosis, you can see one, there is a clinical reasoning video that kind of describes different things that we would do to rule out other structures that may be causing the pain. Here you have the upper trap assessment, palpation, length test and contraction, right? When you look at a muscle, you always typically palpate it, stretch it and resist it. You can also see that we're curious about whether any of this pain is being generated from the upper cervical spine. So this is the cervical flexion rotation test. You can explore this further and you'll see this in conditions that typically refer from the upper cervical spine as a key finding. Here it's a differential diagnostic test. And then here's the Vader scap assessment. Okay, so this is a general differential diagnosis concept here. Let's look into the key findings now. The key findings essentially are the key examination steps that you should take that will define mobility deficits specifically. So here in key findings, you note that there's a, another clinical reasoning video. Neck pain with mobility deficits is associated with the ICD diagnosis, cervical spondylosis. Key findings for this condition, 
include limited cervical range of motion, which is affecting the patient's function, pain reproduction at end ranges, restricted cervical and thoracic segmental mobility, and often reproduction of the patient's symptoms upon palpation, and possible referred shoulder pain with joint provocation. So you can see now that the key findings examination includes cervical active range of motion assessment. So you'll see your assessments of flexion and extension, rotation, side bending, even looking at passive overpressures of these different ranges of motion. And whenever we look at range of motion, we'll also look at accessory mobility. So you can see cervical PAs, posterior to anterior uh, pressures, unilateral PAs, right? The patient is now in a more relaxed position where we can gently apply forces to assess the mobility, looking for stiffness, pain, spasm. You can also assess mobility of the cervical spine using PIVMs, so passive physiologic intervertebral motions. So here are your side glides, your up glides, your down glides, you have all kinds of different ways to assess mobility here. Accessory, physiologic, uh, the side glides, all these physiologic, passive physiologic intervertebral motion assessments. Ultimately, you see that you are looking at primarily mobility for this particular condition. I also want you to see under the physical exam that there are movement faults. So movement faults are common postures and movements that people tend to do too much of or choose to be in that may contribute to the maintenance or the development of this condition. So the pain and the stress to whatever structure is the source of this pain. So you can see in this case, we've generalized this to one of the common movement faults is excessive thoracic kyphosis affecting the neck. So there's a little clinical reasoning video here and it gives you an idea of, hey, I want to observe the patient's posture I want to look at the way they sit, and I want to correct those postures to see if it has any influence on the patient's pain. That will allow me to get a sense, is this really a contributor to the patient's problem? Because I should correct the way that they move. I should correct the postures that they're in. And you can begin to look at some muscles that might contribute to this posture, right? Rounded shoulders, bringing the whole trunk into a flex position, and a number of different movement tests Again, you are looking for excessive thoracic flexion and training them to come into a more neutral spine position, trying to protect the neck. Remember, when the thoracic spine becomes more kyphotic, the cervical spine is affected as well, oftentimes becoming more extended or lordotic, right? There's a lordosis and kyphosis here. And here under the movement fault, another one is relief with cervical scapular muscle unloading. So there's evidence to suggest that in some cases you can really improve movement and pain by unloading the weight of the upper arm or unloading the cervical scapular muscles, uh, basically taking them and putting them all on slack and seeing if the patient's rotation improves. So these are things to consider in lots of people with neck pain. Note that these movement faults may not be specific to any one pathology. So that's why you have to assess whether it influences the patient's symptoms, regardless of what, what category you're looking at. So you'll see this movement faults somewhat repetitive in a lot of the different uh, categories of neck pain. Right, so that's movement faults. And finally, associated impairments. Right, associated impairments is the idea that there may be many common associated impairments that are contributing to the patient's primary problem. So this, you may tie this to the idea of regional interdependence. So if you look here, we've said, well, here's a clinical reasoning video. You can watch that to get a sense of what all of this is talking about. Here we talk about, hey, you better take a look at the thoracic spine. Many times thoracic mobility, active range, quadrant, passive accessory uh, assessments of the thoracic spine will give you some ideas of one, is there pain referral? Or two, is there abnormalities of stiffness, uh, excessive mobility or stiffness that are contributing to the patient's neck pain? 
And many times when you have joint dysfunction, you also have muscle dysfunction. And so you, here you see deep neck flexor, strength and coordination assessments, and deep neck extensor, strength and endurance type assessments. All of these are here because we need to know are these things that we need to put on our list of things to intervene on to treat. So that covers the physical exam. Now when you go back here, you see we've looked through prevalence, clinical findings, the picture of the patient, the physical exam, the expected examination that you should do, and then your interventions. Your interventions should be targeted to the impairments that you have discovered in your physical exam. And technically, because this is a neck pain with mobility deficits, the key activity limitation is the person can't move their neck or head around like they need to. They have limited mobility. So when you look at the clinical reasoning video, you should see that many of the interventions are tied to improving that mobility. Let's take a look. The interventions for this condition always begins with patient education and counseling. Then the use of cervical mobilization and manipulation, thoracic mobilization and manipulation to restore mobility, and exercises to restore range of motion ranging from passive range of motion to active range of motion and stretching exercises. So you can see the clinical reasoning video typically is just a, a short blurb to give you context related to all the techniques you're going to see down here. So when you look at the manual therapy, you'll see that if you found that there was accessory motion limitations, you found stiffness and pain, you can use your same assessment to provide the treatment. Okay, so these are all videos, of course. If you found that there was physiologic mobility, you found side glides were limited, then your side glide assessment becomes your treatment. Right? Either way, you are improving mobility at the joints, at the tissues in the neck. You can see that there's options for cervical manipulation. If you found that there was mobility deficits of the thoracic spine, you can use your different manipulations. Right? And you can also see that we have some passive range of motion treatment as well, depending on how irritable the patient is. When you look at the therapeutic exercises, your therapeutic exercises should also match to address the key impairments you've been treating with your manual therapy. So here under mobility, you see, okay, I've been working on thoracic mobility. Here are some therapeutic exercises that I'm going to use to do the same thing, improve the mobility of the thoracic spine, right? So you have these seated exercises, you have quadrupedic thoracic extension exercises. And because you've been treating mobility of the cervical spine, here are a number of different exercises, mobilization with a ball, towel snags, all of these become exercises that you can utilize to improve the mobility of the spine. Whenever you think about therapeutic exercises, after you restore mobility, you should consider what do I need to do to improve the way people have their better postures, improve their motor coordination and their strength. So here you see that I'm training the patient to improve their thoracic kyphosis. I'm also doing training here. Deep neck flexor training, deep neck extensor training. These are all impairments that I found on my exam. You'll also see functional movement corrections. So wherever there's an appropriate change in the patient's functional movement or some type of functional task, you will also see videos here helping you integrate a lot of these changes in their mobility and their strength into functional coordinated movement. Now as part of the interventions, I also want you to see that we always think about patient education. Here is 
a little bit of information written for you as a clinician to help the patients understand the four main things that they want to know. Here's what's going on. Here's how long it will take. This is what we're going to do in therapy. And this is what you can do to help yourself. Right? So it's important for you to read through these so that you begin to have a, a elevator pitch, something that you can tell the patient that helps relieve their fears, reduce their anxiety, and educate them so they can manage their problem better on their own. I would also link you to the patient education app. So this information here is written for you as the therapist. The patient education app is written for the patient. So I will go to the patient education app, choose head and neck. Here I have a patient with mobility deficits, stiff neck, and we have written a four minute piece directly focused to the patient. We've written it in a way that people will want to read it and they can read a little bit about what it is, what they're going to have in therapy, and there's some basic exercises that we commonly give them to start the mobility enhancing so that they begin to recover. Here's your foam roll exercise. This can be easily shared to the patient by email. And you can see also that we have linked the JOSPT patient perspectives. So you can say, hey, I want you to know how physical therapy can help. Here is a article from our top journal. The patients can basically scan this, take a picture of this with their phone, their QR code reader, or you can just email this article to the patient using the little envelope. Right, so you can send that there. Wherever it is appropriate, you'll see that we have included the modalities. So in this case, the guideline says that there's B evidence, moderate evidence for the use of mechanical traction, or even TENS. Ice packs in the acute situation and heat in the subacute situation. So modalities are relevant. It's good to use the evidence to guide your choice on when to use it. The instructions on how to do it are here, but you can always go to your modalities app, your physical agents app, to begin to get a better sense of how to ask these contraindication precaution questions or how to set up the device. All right, here's the last thing I want you to think about. We are back in the next stiffness, mobility deficit category. I want you to see that we have outcome measures here. It is very important for us because the guideline says there's strong evidence to use these type of questionnaires to measure disability and progress over time. So you can see the key outcome measure here is the neck disability index. This is linked to a resource that is online. You can also see that for further information, we have linked it to one of the best resources on the web, which is the Shirley Ryan Ability Lab. And as needed, you can assess their risk, kind of their yellow flags, pain catastrophizing scale, the brief illness perception questionnaire, and some patient-specific functional scale here, which will allow you to have a, a better idea of how this specifically affects the patient in their life. You can see that we've linked some ideas related to the common activity measures they may have problems with, here are some common impairment measures that you might find during your assessment. And finally, we want you to always think about how this patient may present over the lifespan and also considerations that may contribute to the, a challenge related to their prognosis, how well they recover. It's valuable to consider the use of the geriatric depression scale or the mini mental state exam as needed. All right, so that's a quick glimpse of the mobility deficits category and we'll be talking more about the different categories when we get together. It's important for you now that you've seen how all of this information is laid out to use your clinical pattern recognition worksheets to explore the different patterns of the apps so that when we get together to discuss it, there'll be so much more that we can talk about.